So up to now, the types of events that we've been focusing on have been caused by some type of uh, switching action. And what we're going to look at today is the impact of lightning. And what happens when we have a lightning strike? How do we model it and what types of over voltages we're going to get? Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of start by talking about kind of generally the lightning phenomenon, the characteristics of lightning, and then we'll get into how we kind of model it from an equivalent circuit standpoint. And then we'll do some worked examples and we'll also see how we can model something like this within PSCAD. So before we get into the theory discussion, um, I just want to show you a, a high-speed picture of a lightning strike because this is sort of relevant to what we're going to be discussing in this lecture. What you could see is you could see that you have a lightning strike. Uh, basically what you have in this case is you got a bolt of lightning coming from overhead and what you could see is you could see it coming down from the clouds and it appears to be hitting the tower. All right, so it's, it's, it's hitting the tower. But what you see on here is you see these kind of flashes or these ignitions around the insulation. So what's kind of going on right here because this is relevant to what we're gonna be talking about today. Well, what's happening is you have these ground wires that are attached to the, the towers and the towers are so grounded and what's happening is when you hit this lightning strike, this lightning is trying to find a path to ground. And so what it's going to be doing, some of the energy is going to go um, one way down the ground wire, some of the energy is going to go the other way. But a lot of this energy is going to travel down this tower. And this tower basically looks like a transmission line. It looks like a cable. And what is going to happen is that when this lightning traveling way goes down to the bottom of the tower and comes back um, because of the reflection what we're going to see is we're going to see an increase in the voltage and when the voltage differential between the ground and the insulation becomes high enough then what we're going to get is we're going to get a failure of that insulation and that's going to cause a flashover and so you can see in this case that this was such a powerful bolt that injected so much current that it caused high voltages not only on this phase here but also on this phase and this phase which causes a flashover effect and so basically this is going to cause a short circuit which would then need to be cleared by the operation of circuit breakers um, if it's double-ended um, protection it would have to operate on both ends of the of the transmission line and then once those breakers operate and if you provide some time for the air to, to deionize you can close those circuit breakers back in and so this isn't going to cause a, a generally going to cause a permanent fault this is going to be a generally a temporary fault unless it damages the insulation and this is pretty routine this just simply happens all the time um, on the transmission side and to some degree on the on the distribution side as well and so we're going to be kind of focusing on this this particular phenomenon and how we can go about analyzing it another thing i wanted to point out was is that if we want to try to figure out well what the impact of lightning is going to have on different types of appliances uh, utility appliances then there's actually test facilities set up for doing this um, a lot of these test facilities would be in the state of florida because in the United States, Florida would have the highest incidence of lightning activity. And so in order to do this testing, what they do is they have some mock sections of circuit set up. So they would set up like a three-phase distribution. They would have maybe a test house. Maybe they're testing like meter installations, whatever. They would have like underground cable. And then in order to... Um, provide the lightning, if you want to think about it that way, whenever there's a situation where the clouds are low enough that are going to be associated with lightning, what they do is they actually initiate lightning by shooting off a rocket that has a, a metal thread attached to it. And so basically what happens is instead of just kind of waiting for this to occur at random, they basically initiate the lightning strike 
um, in, a, in a triggered manner by shooting off these rockets and then basically like the lightning bolt will follow the, the metallic thread back uh, to the test facility and then they can actually then test the impact of lightning on various uh, power system apparatus and then they can evaluate what would be the impact of using you know certain types of mitigation strategies so anyway if you're interested in this thing um, you know, this is a reference to one of the reports, but this has been going on for, for a while. Um, so anyway, let's, let's take a look at um, some of the theory, you know, what's kind of behind lightning, and then we'll kind of talk about how we can model it from a, from a circuit analysis standpoint. So we've been talking about different types of overvoltages up to this point and as we've seen these overvoltages occur for a lot of different reasons like i said before we've been kind of focusing more the overvoltages that are caused by switching operations and obviously we're concerned about these overvoltages because we have overvoltages what that does is it puts personnel and our, our components at risk um, you know, we're always concerned about safety first and then, you know, whether the components are going to survive and then there's going to be the impact of reliability. And there's certain things we can do to mitigate the, the impact of these transits. We'll talk about that in the next lecture when we talk about surge arresters. But one of these um, phenomena that is responsible for a lot of overvoltages is, is lightning. And this is um, you know, something that's based on, on weather conditions. But lightning can put extreme stress on, on components. So it's, a, it's a kind of a, a slightly different type of a stress. Like say, um, when people talk about surges, you know, people talk about surges um, when they think about overvoltages in general. And what we've seen before, a lot of this is due to system switching. Um, this could be due to like capacitors switching on and off, or if we have loads being switched in and out involving transformers or inductive loads, um, especially if there's going to be like chopping associated with that. We've seen there because of fault clearing, there's transit recovery voltage that causes high voltages and line switching where we can get like a doubling effect at open terminations. There, there's that type of voltage surge which causes um, you know, over voltage, uh, you know, in terms of like two to three times the source voltage. Uh, we've talked about other sort of voltage uh, issues at, more at the fundamental frequency, uh, like a class like 551, we talk about voltage regulation and issues with load imbalance that might cause, you know, like plus or minus 5% deviation or ferro resonance that might cause a factor too. But, but lightning is, is kind of in a, a different class and what we have to be aware of that, you know, there's going to be the kind of remote possibility of direct strikes lines if the, the shielding would fail. Um, but more than likely that what we need to be looking at is an indirect effect due to lightning hitting our ground protection. And so as far as thinking about this, you know, as far as what causes this large amount of current in the first place, well, this is basically due to the fact that when we have clouds and under certain weather conditions, what we're going to get is we're going to get this separation of charge in a cloud. And so this is kind of a, an older figure here that, that kind of talks about this buildup in charge in the, in the cloud. And I don't, I'm not, I don't have the background in meteorology to kind of explain why this occurs. But basically, uh, what we get when we have, um, especially these um, thunderstorm-related sort of clouds is that we get a, di uh, a differentiation of charge. You know, we get positive charge that accumulates at the top of the cloud. We get negative charge that accumulates toward the bottom. And what we can get from this is when we say we have this differentiation in charge is we can actually get a discharge or lightning within the clouds themselves. Something we're gonna be focusing a little bit more on though is what's this interaction with the earth and the earth basically has you can think about all these positive and negative charges within it but if you have a cloud overhead and it has like a negative charge toward the bottom of the cloud then what we're going to see is we're going to see um, positive charge sort of accumulate at the earth plane 
all right? So what we're going to be more more concerned about initially is going to be this, you know, this fact that we're going to have negative charge in the bottom of the clouds and positive charge at the top. And then there's going to be discharges, which is the, the, the lightning that we, we typically would, would be observing. All right. So as, as far as the mechanics of a lightning flash, um, I guess from folklore, you kind of think about like the god tossing lightning toward the ground. And so you think about it coming from the heavens to earth. Um, but the reality is it's a little bit more complicated than that. And if you probably search through YouTube, you can find high-speed videos of this that kind of shows more detail the, the initiation of a lightning stroke. But basically the way this starts out is if you have the cloud and you have the negative charge build up at the bottom of the cloud, what's going to happen is this is lightning is going to be kind of initiated by having what we call these step leaders of negative charge that kind of emanates toward the ground. It doesn't actually hit the ground, but they kind of stream out from the bottom of the cloud. Um, this doesn't quite take place, at, you know, like at the speed of light, you know, as I say here in the text, 0 0.1 to 0 0.8 meters per, per microsecond. And what happens is when that step leader gets close enough to the ground, what happens is, is there's a, a kind of like a return stroke that starts from the earth and then comes up to to meet that step leader. So in a way, lightning sort of originates from the ground. It, you can kind of think about it that way. And so once this occurs, then what this can actually do is actually this actually can trigger multiple strokes because what's going to happen is we're going to get kind of like an, an initial discharge um, between the bottom of the cloud and Earth, but then given that once this happens and given that you have these different charge centers within a cloud, then that can actually feed multiple restrikes. All right. So when you see lightning, it's not actually just one um, one stroke, but actually a lot of times it's like multiple st strokes that, that that occurs because you have all these different pockets of charge um, that are that are being neutralized. So anyway, here's just some kind of some old diagrams that show this, where you, know, you would start off by having a negative charge at the bottom of the cloud. You'd have these pilot streamers that kind of kind of stream toward ground. The ground basically, as you have the negative charge on the bottom of the cloud, you start to see accumulation of positive charge along the Earth plane. And once this gets low enough, then basically what happens is we get this return leader from Earth, where we get this. Um, basically what you see is a lightning strike, right? And then what can happen is once you get this first action right here, then you can have multiple reaction, you can have multiple follow-ups, multiple restrikes occur because of the fact that these clouds can have different charge centers which actually discharge um, once this whole thing starts to take place. As far as where you're likely to see lightning, this uh, type of data is, is shown in what they refer to as an isochronic map. Um, th what this shows is it shows the number of thunderstorm days per year. And so the idea would be that if you have your weather information and you can, you can have the number of thunderstorm days per year, that the lightning activity is going to kind of correlate to that. So you can see in places like Florida in the lower right that they would have like 100 thunderstorm days per year. You get to like North Carolina where between 40 and 50 thunderstorm days per year. You get out to the west and actually this drops off quite a bit. And so depending on where you're at in the United States, there's different earth conditions that would make areas more susceptible to other um, for lightning and um, basically you would know like if you're designing towers you know how many thunderstorm days you would have per year. Now this is kind of based on weather information and what we actually have nowadays is actually have more detailed maps that are based specifically on lightning measurements and so um, there's this National Lightning Detection Network in the United States and um, 
this is run by a company I think is pronounced Vaisala. And what they have is they have these antennas that are located throughout the United States. And these antennas cover a certain area. And what these antennas do is actually would pick up on the lightning strikes. And so what they do is they put all this stuff in a database and they can produce maps. So you could actually see, um, you know, what's going on in the United States in terms of the number of events and the flash density, whatever, you know, how many times this is going to occur per year. You see it kind of matches up in a way with the isochronic map I had on the previous slide. But this is actually a lot more exact in terms of actually basing everything on these remote measurements. And if you're a utility, what you can do is you can actually then subscribe to the service. And so let's suppose you're in North Carolina and you want to know um, whether lightning is causing some reliability issues in terms of a lot of faults. Well, what you can do is for a given time, like say if you had a, um, an operation yesterday, you can actually go into this database and you can see if there is a lightning strike at a specific location that would correspond to maybe a transmission line that had faulted. And so uh, this provides a lot of useful data that could be used for um, lightning mitigation now. So as far as what this looks like, you know, as, as far as if you're going to take a measurement and if you're going to look at kind of like the pattern associated with this, um, a lot of times what we do is, is we talk about um, current characteristics, a current injection. I know this particular graph right here is, is has voltage on the vertical axis, but voltage and current are basically re directly related by a by a surge impedance. And so we really think more about uh, lightning in terms of a current injection, in terms of charge. And so what characterizes a, a lightning stroke is, is it's going to have a certain peak current. Um, this is going to be in terms of kiloamperes. We're concerned about the rise time. We're, we're concerned about how quickly this goes from zero up to its peak value. Because if we have a high value of DIDT, then that's going to cause a high change in voltage with respect to time, which is going to cause insulation to fail faster. Um, so anyway, we have this front duration associated with it. We have the time associated with the rise time, which in this diagram right here is given by T1. And then we have the tail time, where this tail time corresponds to the time it takes to go from its peak value to half of the peak. And so generally it has this particular shape, although in terms of computer modeling, we usually kind of model this as kind of like a sawtooth or a triangular type of wave just to kind of simplify things. And as far as the rise times, and these rise times are typically in terms of microseconds. As far as the tail times, you know, 50 microseconds might be a typical sort of value. And so what we're seeing here in this particular graph is, is what's used a lot of times like in a test pattern. If we're going to test equipment, we typically have certain standardized waveforms that we test with respect to, and 1.2 by 50 microseconds is a very commonly used type of a test waveform for representing things like, for, like the impact of lightning. There's other um, things we can look at when we're when we're looking at lightning, and one thing about lightning is that we're not going to get the same magnitude of the current each time. Some strokes are more powerful than others. There's going to be different rise times um, for different lightning strikes. There's going to be different tail times for lightning strikes, and so this is all probabilistic in nature, and so. If, if you were going to take a look in a, in a given area, you know, like what's the probability of hitting a certain magnitude of lighting, what you could, lightning, what you could do is you can put this in terms of a, like a probability of occurrence diagram. And you could see that it's possible to get these real super strokes, say like 160, 140, 120, 100 kiloamps, but they're very, very rare you know, as, as far as how often they occur, probably when not occur more than one or two percent of the time. Um, for the 50 percent level, you could see that this is more around 20 kiloampers. And so 
um, 50 percent of the time we're going to get less than 20 kiloamperes and 50 percent of the time we're going to get more than that but it's only going to be a one or two percent of the time that we're going to get up to these super strokes and and this is kind of useful information because it may not be feasible to design up to the maximum possible lightning strike you could ever get i mean once in a while it's just going to fail right it's too expensive to uh, withstand your maximum peak current but what we can do is we can design up to you know like 80 percent of the strokes we would expect to see or 90 percent of the strokes we expect to see so having this sort of data for a given area getting this data from companies like Vaisala what we can do is we can kind of use some probabilistic concepts in our design and we could design for five percent of the strokes or 90 percent of the strokes or 80 percent whatever because again, to have 100% protection against lightning would be very expensive. Not only is the peak of the stroke probabilistic, but also the, the time it takes to get to its crest. And you can see like about 50% of the time, we're within, you know, between one and two microseconds. Uh, and so we could have some situations where it takes a while to get to the peak value, but you can see that these are very rare as well. So, so typically they, they tend to have very fast rise times. Um, and it could get up to like 100 kiloamperes in magnitude, but that would be a very rare type of event. So how do we protect against lightning strikes? Um, the way we protect against lightning strikes, you know, one way we do that, is we're going to put ground shields up above our transmission lines and so if we have say like a transmission tower what we could do is we could put ground wires up above our tower and it's not really highlighted that well but basically you see these two wires two conductors at the top this is typically what you're going to see and if you look at substations you'll actually see wire that's strung overhead over a substation um, so basically when you have this wire strung up overhead what you're trying to do is you're trying to attract the lightning to hit those ground wires instead of actually hitting the phase conductors that are underneath it turns out that if you have these ground wires that are a distance h above the ground and if you have a distance between those ground wires given by b that there's actually a shadow effect where basically what you're going to see is you're going to see kind of like an effective shield setup where this shield is going to have a canopy that's going to be given by 4h plus b all right so what's going to happen is if you have lightning striking from above let's say if it's over kind of it's over here what's going to happen is it's going to get attracted to the top of the tower to those ground wires in, instead of hitting something underneath this plane so so basically what this is doing is, is providing a, a shielding effect it's not always a hundred percent but it basically provides sort of like a shielding uh, type of effect all right so let's kind of move on all right so there's some empirical data on this in terms of you know like a number of flashes you expect per year this is kind of an old derived formula right here like say if you had like the Vaisala data you could probably get a little bit more specific about this um, but as far as having the shadow effect with these ground wires um, you can actually derive a formula and like I say this is kind of a, an older formula where you can kind of predict the number of lightning flashes to expect per 100 kilometers of line per year. The T term is this isochronic number, so this is the number of thunderstorm days per year. And then B and H would be the distances and meters associated with their ground wires. And this is something that's just based on field data. There's no physics behind the coefficients on here. This is just simply based on uh, observations, all right? So what this basically shows is you can actually come up with some predictions for the, the number of lightning flashes that you might have per year um, based on your um, based on the, the local isochronic rate and your um, tower protection design. 
for modeling the lightning, for modeling the lightning, then what we're going to do is we're going to represent the lightning as a current source in parallel with an impedance would be the general model. And so you would have like a stroke current, you would have the impedance of the stroke channel. And then when it hits a conductor, then basically it's the voltage you're going to get is going to depend on the characteristic impedance of that conductor. It turns out that this surge impedance here is going to be a lot less than the lightning channel impedance. So a lot of times what we do is we just neglect the lightning channel impedance. We just model lightning as just simply a current injection that's going to react with a surge impedance in order to give you the voltage. And so the surge impedance that we're talking about overhead would be between 300 and 600 ohms. If we're talking about cables, you know, it'd be more like 50, 75. But we're primarily concerned at this point about the, the reaction with transmission towers. So anyway, here's a simplified model. And then, as I mentioned before, a lot of times, instead of actually showing the exponential characteristic, now you might see in computer programs where they give you the ability of actually putting in the exponential curve. Um, you certainly could do that, but a lot of times this is just simply going to be modeled by a triangular waveform. And so it's going to have a certain rise time, in this case 1.2 microseconds. It's going to have a tail time, in this case I'm showing this for 50 microseconds. And so what we can do is we can characterize this by the peak value, the, the rise time, and also the tail or decay time. And once we have these three values, and we can define this curve. Uh, one thing you have to watch out for when you're doing this modeling is then basically how do we model the surge impedance effect? And, and let's suppose that we have lightning and it's striking a ground wire um, that's not near a tower. What's going to happen? Well, typically the assumption we make is that the lightning is going to split in two directions. Uh, half of it's going to go to the left, half of it's going to go to the right. And what you're going to see in either case is you're going to see Z0 going to the left and Z0 going to the right. As far as the net impedance that the lightning sees at this particular point, it's going to be Z0 in parallel with Z0. In other words, uh, what it sees when it sees the left-hand side and the right-hand side is like it's seeing the parallel combination of those two z naughts, which is z naught divided by 2. Uh, if you want to make this a little bit um, more general, then something else we could have, let's suppose this happens at a tower, right? So suppose this happens at a tower, then something else we're going to have to take into account is this tower is going to have to have an impedance. And then basically what this does is it sets up a kind of like a three-way current divider in a way where if we didn't have the tower, it would just be a two-way. But actually there could be a three-way split, and we'll see this in some of the worked examples. So as, as far as the impact, let's suppose we're doing some analytics on this. What's, what's going to be the impact of the stroke once we start doing some calculations? Obviously it depends on the magnitude of this current. You know, what are we going to assume for the peak value? It's going to depend on the, the rise time. It's going to depend on the surge impedances that are involved in the lightning strike. A lot of times the, the surge impedance of the, the ground wire. And then as far as whether this is going to cause a problem or not, what we need to calculate once we have these first three items is whether we're going to get a failure of insulation. And so we could get a voltage rise across insulation, and maybe the insulation won't fail. Um, but we have to figure out exactly how the lightning is going to impact the voltage across our insulation. And if it's going to exceed our basic insulation level, then we're going to have a, what we call a flashover in this case. And then that's basically going to be seen as a fault. And then we have to have our protection operate in order to clear that fault. Um, we could also have two, if we have the, the over voltage due to lightning, we could also have some additional shielding out there to keep that lightning from hitting in the first place or not as much of the energy getting injected. 
And then something else we'll talk about in the next lecture is the use of surge arresters. So basically, we could put something in parallel with the insulation in order to absorb that lightning energy and kind of divert the current away such that we clamp the voltage. And we'll be using some nonlinear elements for doing that. What, we'll, what we can look at is we can look at shielding failure, we can look at backflash. And the, the way we think about this is we think about having a tower where we have at the top of this, what we're going to have is we're going to have our, say, our two ground conductors. You know, this is, this is basically bounded to the tower. Uh, a lot of times this tower is going to be metallic. It doesn't have to. I mean, we could actually have um, ground wires run down from the tower top to the earth ground. And then underneath what we're going to have is we're going to have our, our phase conductors. And so if it's a, a single circuit instead of a double circuit, you're going to have like a phase A, a phase B, and a phase C. So phases B and C aren't shown in this case. And then we'll have some sort of a a connection between the ground wire, and it could be through the tower or through conductors, to earth. And at the bottom of the tower, what we're going to have is we're going to have some type of a ground system. It could just be ground rods or it could be different sort of grounding systems, but we'll see later. It's going to be very, very important to have a good ground here at the bottom of the tower. So if this is kind of our scenario as far as the the transmission line design, then one thing that could happen, I could say, if we have the shield wires, this shouldn't happen very often, but we could actually get a direct strike to a phase conductor. Um, in this case, what we would have to consider is we have to consider the fact that this phase conductor is coupled to earth through a capacitance. And we talked about, you know, calculating these lump line parameter capacitance. Well, this would be a capacitance like CAN, for example. And the voltage that we're going to get at this particular point, due to the charge it gets injected, this voltage is going to be related by Q over C, right? And so it turns out that this charge is large enough that we can actually get an over voltage. And given that this tower is going to be at ground potential, then if we have a really large voltage here, then it's going to cause a failure of this insulation. We're going to get too much voltage across here, and then we're going to get a flashover associated with that. Um, but the event we spend more time focusing on in this class is what we can refer to as a backflash. And this is the case where you would have, like your ground wire, you would have the lightning strike, either the ground wire or strike the top of the tower. And what happens is this lightning is going to split. Some of its current's going to go to the left, some of the current's going to go to the right. It depends on the relative surge impedance. Some of that current's going to go toward down the, the tower. We're, we're going to say this tower has an impedance, surge impedance given by ZT, and it's going to have a footing resistance RF. So when this lightning propagates down the tower, it's just like, just looks like a line. Um, once it hits the bottom, there's going to be a reflection back toward the top of the tower where this reflection coefficient is going to be the footing resistance minus the tower surge impedance over the sum of those two. So if we could somehow get a perfect ground resistance, say it was um, a value that kind of at least would kind of match up with the tower, you know, um, what we would get is we would get no reflection at all. But actually, if we can get that footing resistance to be less than the tower uh, surge impedance, actually this becomes negative. And what this does is actually subtracts from the voltage we have at the top due to the lightning strike. The other thing that could happen would be if this footing resistance was really large. So let's say RF went to infinity, became a lot greater than ZT. Then this reflection coefficient would become 1. So basically, whatever voltage you had here, once it goes down the tower and, and gets reflected back,
basically what this is going to give us, this is going to give us a voltage doubling effect at the top of the tower, which, uh, which is likely to cause the, the failure of the insulation here. So this is kind of what we're looking at uh, in a lot of our calculations. We're looking at this particular sort of an event is whether we're going to have a, a, a potential failure of, of the tower insulation. And could be that we could do something about that footing resistance, for example, where if that footing resistance is kind of high, we could maybe look at what would be the impact of spending some, some more money on that, on that ground. Something else we could also model, which I'm not going to do in here because it adds some more complication, is there's going to be some coupling between the phase wire and also the um, ground wire. We talked about the fact that there's this um, mutual capacitance, mutual inductance effect, um, LAB or CAB between the ground wire and the phase conductor. So if I have a voltage on the ground wire, then that's going to induce a voltage on the phase wire. And what that could potentially do is that can actually cut down on the amount of stress it's going to have on the insulation. Uh, I'm not going to cover that in the examples because it uh, makes them quite a bit more complicated. But if you guys are doing this stuff in PSCAD and if you're using the line model that has the um, mutual coupling effect in there, that would actually be taken into account then on your, your computer studies. And so we're just trying to do these things by hand just to the extent where you could see, you kind of understand the phenomena. And then probably if you were going to do this in practice, you would just use some type of an EMTP program for this. So anyway, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a worked example and I'll explain this in the next video. And then once we go through and work this example, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how we can model this in PSCAD then.